Welcome to Essential Ingredients, powered by Next Gen Purpose, hosted by me, Justine Reichman. Every Tuesday, we serve up thoughtful conversations with founders, sustainability leaders, and community organizers who share their stories and missions within the regenerative food sphere. It's all about boosting forward-thinking folks and brands working to make better for you and better for the planet food more accessible. Good morning and welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm your host, Justine Reichman. With me today is Greg, Gregory Kalinin, who is the co-founder of Holistic Roasters. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you very much for having me, Justine. And by the way, do you go by Greg or Gregory? Greg is fine. Greg is fine? Okay. It's a lot more to say. I can make Yeah, Gregory is such more. a mouthful. Gregory is. <laughs> aura, aura, aura. <laughs> so anyway, for, you know, first, just before we get going, and we learn more about you. I'd love to just introduce, so folks have a little concept of what we're talking about. What is Holistic Roasters? Holistic Roasters is a company that we have actually two brands that we we work with, or two types of coffees. One is uh, a biodynamic coffee. Uh, we have three roast levels of, of biodynamic coffee, the Rubicon, the Rise and Shine, and the French Roast. And we also do uh, organic coffee uh, in compostable bags, um, and it's called Melk, M-E-L-K, and that's associated with um, uh, cafes in, in Montreal. So it's uh, it's kind of a long-standing third-wave coffee brand in Montreal, um, and so we roast those two um, brands, and uh, we've been doing it for about seven years now. Wow, awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. So... Before we continue on this conversation, for those folks that are not familiar with the term biodynamic, can we explore that for a second? Can you tell me when you're talking about biodynamic, what does it mean to you? So biodynamic is kind of the OG of organic agriculture. Uh, it started in the 1920s, um, and it's it's basically a, a way of focusing on soil health is maybe the best way I can I can describe it, where you know, the link then to kind of today from a, today's perspective is kind of the big push around regenerative agriculture and biodynamic uh, agriculture is, is just another form of, of regenerative agriculture. So it's really focused on creating an ecosystem on a farm where you don't need any external inputs, right? That everything that you uh, need to grow really high quality food you can you can get from the farm itself so that includes the compost um you know it it doesn't require then any external inputs like pesticides or chemical fertilizers or herbicides or fungicides and i guess maybe you know your audience would be familiar with uh, apricot lane farms there was a, a really great documentary um called um the biggest little farm uh, oh yes, Netflix. I'm sure that they're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it's such an inspiring um, movie or or documentary. It's about this couple who um, you know took this dilapidated farm and turned it into this thriving ecosystem. And it goes through you know the challenges of taking this this farm that had completely been depleted and basically the land had been destroyed. And it took them several years, but now you look at it and it's it's an incredible transformation. The one thing they don't mention in the documentary is that they use biodynamic principles to do that. So I think it's a certified biodynamic farm. Um, and and just to kind of complete that that story is it's it's biodynamic is is um, you know a trademarked um, uh, word that uh, you you need to get certification for from a, an organization called Demeter or Demeter. And uh, so they they will do both the the farms, looking at the farms to make sure that all those principles in terms of soil health, in terms of biodiversity, all that that creating of that ecosystem is done well. And I think it's probably the the the, the highest standard of like what you would say either regenerative or or organic agriculture there is. Uh, and but it goes beyond just the farming. So we are also certified by Demeter in terms of how we then handle the the coffee beans in this case from the farm to our roaster, you know, including even the, the kind of packaging we use, you know, they want to make sure that there are no uh, opportunities for any contamination in, in the coffee. So that's why we, we like to say, you know, our coffee is no compromised coffee. It's, it's really clean. It's healthy. It's good, not only for the environment, but I think it tastes really good because it comes from 
you know, soil that is full of, you know, vitality and nutrition. And I think you can taste that in the coffee. It's also good for the farming communities because, you know, they're living a much healthier lifestyle. They're more independent. They're, they're actually getting a lot better um, yields as well. Um, so I think there's just, if you look at it from a holistic perspective, I can't think of a better way of growing food than, than that kind of focus on regenerative agriculture. Yeah, and I agree. And I think that a lot of people are not familiar with these terms, right? You're even, we're talking about regenerative agriculture, which if you can give a short definition of what that means to you, that'd be great because I've had a variety of people come on and we've had, you know, they're all similar, but a little bit different, a little bit of a different take on it. So I'd love to hear from you how biodynamic fits into the larger umbrella of regenerative. Well, as I mentioned, it's, it's, I think it's the original, um, uh, you know, way of, of doing uh, regenerative agriculture. I mean, if you look at it from a traditional standpoint, I mean, that's just the way things were grown previously. You know, there was like low tillage or, or no tillage in, in many cases, the farms were self-sufficient. They tended to be smaller family run farms. Um, and it's, you know, I, I would say that in the way of, of that maybe most people are familiar with the term biodynamic is, is when it comes to wine. You know, a lot of people are familiar with biodynamic wines. And I think one of the things that got me interested in the concept, it wasn't the only thing, but it was one of the things is just seeing how many of the biodynamic wines were kind of award winning wines. You know, they tended to produce really, really great wines. Not uniformly, but generally they were, you know, uh, cut above. And you look at what was the reason behind that. And it came down to how everything was grown. And I, I think the, the thing that that distinguishes it the most is it's back to that ecosystem, is creating an ecosystem that is harnessing it's not, it's not technology, but it's, if you think of it, cause I'm a tech guy, I, I kind of was always fascinated in tech and, and like really wanted to understand systems from that perspective, but it's nature systems. How, how does nature work, uh, creating a, like a symbiotic relationship between the, the, the microbial life in the soil that works in harmony with the plants. So they actually have a, uh, the, the plants give off sugars through the roots that feed the bacteria and the microbiology in the soil. And that in turn then extracts the minimum, the, the minerals and the vitamins from the soil and feeds it to the plant. So if you think of, of that process, it's a perfect, you know, um, symbiosis between those two things. The problem happens is when you look at conventional agriculture is you start to say, well, we're going to supplement that with, um, say chemical fertilizer, but what that ends up, or pesticides or things that you're trying to like disrupt the, that ecosystem in a way to try to improve it. But the problem is then is you become dependent on those chemical fertilizers because it, it they tend to destroy the, the microbiology in the soil and it disrupts that, that symbiosis. And so then you can become stuck in that you need to, to use fertilizer every year in order to get, you know, the, the maximum yields from, from the plants. And this is a way of like reversing that and saying, well, let's go back to a way where that's not needed. And in fact, it's a better way if you look at it from the perspective of giving the, the plants everything they need in terms of all the, the nutritional requirements of a plant is actually much better fulfilled from that, that, um, that symbiosis with the, the microbiology in the soil rather than just the, you know, the chemical fertilizers, which are focused on, you know, phosphorus, um, nitrogen, and potassium. So there's like at least 40 <laughs> nutritional requirements that plants have, not just those three. So, and I think you end up tasting it in the food too, as I mentioned. So, yeah. you know, it's like when you get a, an heirloom tomato that you pick fresh from your garden or from a farmer's market and you taste that compared to a conventionally grown tomato mm -hmm. and there's a huge taste difference. And I think in part that taste difference is in, in, you know, the antioxidants in the, 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 you know, the trace minerals in the nutrition in the, in the plant, in the tomato. Oh, yeah. And you can taste it. And so that to me is is where from a consumer perspective is like, I want really healthy, good tasting food. And in our case, we we just happen to focus on on coffee. So, you know, get I know that you focus on coffee, and I'm curious, was the interest in coffee? Did it what came first? The interest in regenerative agriculture and building something from that standpoint, or was coffee, you know, the first interest? So what happened first? 
coffee actually happened first. So I can, I can remember my first, I mean, I wasn't a coffee drinker in high school. I started drinking coffee in university just, you know, to study for exams. And it was like from the machine and, you know, I was, was not great, but it gave me caffeine and that helped me study. So I was, I was always happy about that. But I was working in, in Japan and do you know what a siphon coffee is? No, what's a siphon coffee? So oh, siphon coffee is the one where they have the the, the Bunsen burner underneath, and yes, it almost looks like a coffee. chemistry experiment. Where, coffee. yeah, and so I, I was in, I was having breakfast in a restaurant, sitting at the bar, and somebody prepared uh, a siphon coffee, and I just the visual aspect of it kind of impressed me, and then the taste of the coffee was so amazing, and it just uh, I loved everything about it, and eventually when I came back to um, I moved to Montreal and I, I got into coffee just kind of um, by accident, but I went deep. I ended up buying an espresso machine and then a grinder. And then I got a, a little home roasting machine and I was like sourcing green beans and, and doing all that. Freaking and me out over coffee. Freak, like I became a geek, a coffee geek. Uh, <laughs> you know. And luckily in my neighborhood, um, a couple opened a third wave coffee shop, Dominic uh, Jacques and Miriam Asselin. Wait, so nope. for those not familiar, what's third wave coffee? Third wave coffee is just kind of um it kind of grew out of the the kind of uh when when Starbucks started introducing kind of a higher quality of coffee rather than just you know the you know the the instant or the you know the kind of coffee you'd get from the, the grocery store, kind of a higher level um of coffee, you know, focusing on espresso and espresso drinks. The next stage was, you know, the smaller kind of local coffee shops that really focused on high quality beans of really creating um, you know, kind of almost from like a inspired from maybe the Italian espresso, um, that next level of coffee, which is really focusing on just high quality beans prepared in a in a really good way um as you know you 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 have a coffee ritual i think that you you do every morning i do that's all came out of the third wave coffee kind of um movement yeah because and, my first coffee started actually it was with the espresso machines that you you boiled the water on and then you had the little espresso and i used to make my illy coffee in there and oh then yeah my illy coffee i upgraded to or upgraded or just moved to nespresso when those big machines came when the machines came out and then after the espresso was when I was like, no, I really want to make my coffee. So I made French press. And now I've arrived with the rocket. Oh, yeah. That's a great that's my whole story. That's, that's my, that's my uh, coffee. My yeah. coffee story. <laughs> so I became at friends point, with... Wait, wait. At which point did I become part of the third wave? So I think with the rocket, that's really, I think, where, where it, it... I mean... Uh, I would also say, you know, if it sounds like you were using a Bialetti on, on the stove talk where you, yeah. And that's also, I mean, it's, um, you know, I think that's also a really fun way of preparing coffee. So the the one thing I would say is Nespresso probably was a, a diversion from, from, from that, that trend a bit, but it's, it's super convenient. So I definitely understand why, you know, I used to have an espresso machine as well. So, yeah, no, I think I think everybody's got to do what they they want to. But it's really interesting to understand the different kinds of beans and then the opportunity to have these biodynamic or organic or, you know, something that's part of the regenerative movement, because a it's better for us and it's better for the planet. Right. So you're making a better choice when you choose that. So if you're given one you know can or bag of beans and they're not from that kind of thought process and you have the option of buying the other, buying this enables you to have something that's better for you, better for everyone else. It supports the business that's doing it to create a better environment. So, I mean, there's just so many reasons why that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I feel like it's part of being a good citizen, a good global citizen. And it's not just helping your own community. So like from, from my perspective, when this, this, you know, couple opened this third wave coffee shop around the corner from where I lived, it, it was part of creating that community in our neighborhood of, of here's a, 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 lo a local couple who are starting off in, in, you know, their business, opening a coffee shop and participating in that becoming friends with them, um, seeing the impact it had on the neighborhood too, and how, much everyone loved it 
you know, the, the baristas that were there, you know, they, they treated, you could see that they treated their, their employees really well. Um, it was always a, like such a positive interaction to go in to that milk, um, coffee shop and spend some time and have conversations with people, you know, the, the baristas, the, the owners. And the, the interesting thing is you couldn't tell who was who you didn't like, Oh, that's the owner. And that's the barista. In fact, a lot of people thought one of the baristas was the owner and, and treated him as the owner, whereas the actual owner is like, I'm fine with that. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it so, was it was such a nice kind of um, atmosphere that they created. So as you're exploring these things and living in Japan and, and, you know, being introduced to this new coffee shop, where did you and your co-founder then come up with a holistic coffee? So it was actually started off as a, as a fundraiser. So the school that my my children went to was a Waldorf school, and they said, you know, we'd like to do a fundraiser, and we thought it would be interesting to maybe figure out how to do coffee because they were always like very much had like they had a farmers market that they used to to raise, and so it was a lot of like the local farms who were biodynamic farms would bring in their 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 produce and sell and say, you know, we we can sometimes get some wine too, but you know, we feel like coffee would be really good, but we don't even know if biodynamic coffee exists, so. I, I kind of love a challenge. And so I was like, oh, well, maybe I could help with that. I'm kind of, I, I like entrepreneurial ventures. And so I sourced some biodynamic coffee from Peru. I had a few hundred pounds of green coffee shipped up to, to Montreal. And I found a local roaster who was willing to roast it for me. And got a, you know, put it in bag, like just with a scoop and a scale, was doing it all by hand and putting a label on it. And we use that as a fundraiser uh, at the school. And it became popular and they said, you know, let's, let's keep doing this, you know, and, and this is, you know, a nice little extra revenue stream for the school. And it helps us to make sure we pay our, our teachers a good salary and everything. Can we, I mean, it's contributed a small amount to that, but um, you know, and then I decided I will talk to Dominic and Miriam about it. And I was like, you know, this is kind of interesting. And I think it's uh, it's maybe something that you could be interested in and get involved with and initially they thought well you know we we don't really have our own brand of coffee we don't really want to become roasters but we're really interested in the idea that you know maybe this is something we could um you know expand into and so dominic and i on kind of a, a last minute because we're both kind of uh <laughs> we like to do things kind of last minute sometimes as many entrepreneurs do so we decided kind of last minute we're going to go to Honduras to visit this biodynamic coffee farm so uh we met up uh, on, we took separate flights because I I was uh on vacation already I was in Florida and so I very short trip from from Miami to to um Tegucigalpa and he flew in from from Montreal and we spent 3 or 4 days with this family who um, is in, in the Makala region of Honduras, and it's it's known for its organic coffee. So um, they had worked really hard to kind of transition from conventional coffee growing, which tends to rely really, really heavily on on pesticides and, and chemical spraying. And they'd converted 80% of the, this coffee region into organic coffee, and they were in the process of then um, moving that to the next stage, which was biodynamic. So we spent three, it felt like we were there for two weeks. We, we packed in so much, you know, uh, time with, with the family, stayed with them, you know, went on event, like hikes with them, explored the, the coffee farm, which is interesting. You would think, what does a coffee farm look like? You think, oh, most people think rows and rows of coffee trees, right? No, this was completely integrated into the, into the jungle, into the forest. And so it just, it was like walking through the forest and just happened to be a number of, of coffee trees that were, were growing there. And it was so interesting to kind of feel like it was just part of nature, almost this, this, this place. It was, it didn't seem like a farm. Um, and we decided at the end of that, well, let's, let's make a go of it. We ended up um, importing, I think it was 50, 60 kilogram bags of coffee and, um, and decided to to launch holistic roasters and uh the biodynamic coffee wow that's yeah. exciting so out of curiosity you know were you both entrepreneurs beforehand yes yes okay so yeah. this is another so you've had experience this is not your first time at the rodeo and so doing this this time versus in your previous ventures because you had that experience 
what did you do differently that you think you might not have done without that experience? Uh, well, I, I knew what to worry about and what not to worry about. So the first time as an entrepreneur, you think everything is a crisis or everything is super important, right? You're worried that like you, you, you panic about a lot of things that you don't necessarily need to panic about. So it's just the, the, once you go through it once and you know, he, you know, here's what's important. Here's where we need to put in some effort. Here's where we can, um, you know, not be as, as stressed out that, that always helps. Um, but not to say that we didn't make mistakes because, you know, anytime you go into something new, my, my previous experience had more to do with e-commerce and online marketing and, you know, other manufacturing businesses, things like that, but never in, like, in the food business as a, as a direct consumer product that, that I was, you know, doing the, where, that we were doing the importing and the roasting and the shipping for. So there were definitely, and the packaging on too. So were definitely some mistakes we made along the way, nevertheless, but you know, you, you learn from them and you, you fix the mistakes and you just continue on. So it's, uh, it's not the end of the world when you make a mistake, typically, I agree. hopefully. And I, th <laughs> I think it's part of the process, frankly, right? Yeah. But, you know, for those listeners that are new to entrepreneurship, what are some of the things that, you know, maybe you'd focus, you know, that are red flags that you need to worry about and other things that maybe you can just take a breath? <laughs> Well, so one of the the red flags is is I guess the product market fit. So sometimes you you're in love with something, but nobody else really cares, <laughs> and that's important to kind of see. You know, is it is it just something you're obsessed about, or is this something that other people are are going to be you know interested in as well? And but that's the the process there, and and the reason why it was fairly easy for us is started small, right? We started with a, let's just do a fundraiser, a small amount, let's test it out. Let's see if people like it. And if, and you don't have to commit to a big process. It can be very small just to test something. And then you say, okay, with that feedback, can I go to the next level? And then do another small test and say, well, if I do this, you know, does it, does it work? Is there any demand for this without, you know, deciding I've got to do a huge business plan. I have to get a loan. I have to get fundraising. I have to just do some small tests to see, mm -hmm. to test the concept, I think is, is one of the key things that, that we did. And we took it pretty slowly just to, to determine. But I think one of the, the, at, at one point we decided, okay, this is worth kind of going a little bit further and that is when um, we decided to pitch the coffee to Erewhon. Uh, Erewhon oh. is a, yeah. And it was very early well, on in our process. For those that are not familiar, it's, it's a, a better, a good for you food market. That's an elevated experience in the Los Angeles, in the Southern California area. Um, right. So just a just lot of, knows. yeah, a lot of food companies uh, when they're starting off, they kind of have Erewhon as their, like, if I can get into Erewhon, then I know I'm, I'm, you know, in a, you know, there's legit. You're legit. Uh, legit. And, you know, it's <laughs> like, it also brings a lot of credibility and, and things like that. So we decided to try and it was, it was really easy for us um, because we were such a good fit. You know, they were interested, we, they were interested in biodynamic and organic agriculture. They, they knew about um, Apricot Lane Farms. They were working with them. Um, you know, it just was a perfect fit. Everything like we would look at what they said on their website and what we had and was like, well, they're also interested in, you know, uh, soil health or, you know, replenishing aquifers when it rains or, you know, climate change and carbon sequestration, all those things are like, okay, so how can they say no, right? It's like a perfect product for them. And, and that's kind of how it worked. So that was another kind of, okay, this is the next little, we can, we can go a little bit further with this um, and, and see how it goes. So little things like that. Right now. And I think that's super important because I can't tell you, people fall in love with their ideas. What I found is many people, including myself, I've fallen in love with ideas. But I think one of the things that I've learned is that you falling in love with ideas, okay, but you have to be able to be open to hear what other people are saying about it and be able to evolve and pivot accordingly. Because the more information we get, the more we dig into it, it's only natural we're going to learn more things. So learning from that and taking that advice and those experiences that other people share can really allow you to create a more robust and meaningful brand or product. Um, I think when we dig our heels in just because we love it, we're not doing anybody a service, including ourselves. Um, 
the best thing is uh, customers who are upset about something because there's such a good source of of opportunity to improve things you know when a customer like is upset or has negative feedback that's you know people often they care. shy away from that but it's go ahead sorry they care they care yeah they, like that's you're messing a, with their product almost yeah if they care enough to product. let you know you should listen listen to what they're saying and and uh you know and and move on from there so yeah, we we had some of that uh, early feedback from from customers that uh, around the packaging in particular that you know we decided to pivot on. Well, that's and that's such an important lesson, right? So here, if you didn't if you weren't open to hearing what those customers had to say, you might not have tweaked your packaging, which would ultimately be probably more brand. It's probably more brand aligned now and allows you to really be in a market with sustainable packaging and you know everything that works to make a holistic product not just the coffee but the packaging and everything in the greatest sense of the word holistic absolutely yeah we we thought i mean just to go into that uh what we the mistake we made on the packaging is we thought okay we want something that's going to really stand out and be different so we decided to put the coffee in a in a compostable bag but then inside a box and then put a label over it uh and the issue was first of all it's, it's great it like it looks different and so it kind of helps us stand out but the problem was it was in a craft box because that was you know the most compostable way we could do it and it didn't stand out on the shelves it was a lot of material too you think we have a bag and a box and a sticker and from a labor perspective it was like very labor intensive to 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 do all of that also cost. And a lot of was, packaging. And a, lot a lot of packaging, packaging exactly. A lot of packaging. G doing the opposite of what we were trying to do. We're just like, we're focused on compostable, but like, why don't you focus on just reducing the amount of packaging? Um, and then, you know, the other things was one, the cost. And then two is shipping those boxes. They tended to get crushed in shipping. And so then they tended to look really not great on the shelves and they didn't stand out very well. You know, a craft box on the shelf is like, I could stand in front. I was at Erewhon looking for the coffee. I know it's here and I can't <laughs> see it. It's like, Oh, there it is. It just blends in with everything else. Right. So we changed that. We, we took that feedback and, and decided to redo things. And, and maybe the second piece of advice for entrepreneurs is as soon as you can afford it, work with experts, don't try to do everything yourself. If you, you know, you're good at some things, focus on the things that you're good at and that you like doing. And as soon as you can work with experts who can, who know what they're doing in some areas and who will make your lives so much easier if you just accept that you can't do everything yourself. Well, I would even go, I would say another thing in addition to that, not because I think that's super important, but many times when you get started, you can bring on advisors and mentors in those in that capacity to surround yourself with those experts before you can afford to pay them or you know give them a piece of whatever it is you're building but people entrepreneurs are happy to mentor new entrepreneurs many times i mean i'm not going to say every single person but i mean the ones that i've spoken to are always eager to help you know these new generation of entrepreneurs build a better world a better place better products so I would say when you have the the money, definitely when you have the funding. And before that, I think it's, you know, people are not inaccessible. People are accessible. They want to share their wins. They want to share what's worked, what hasn't worked and resources. So in the beginning, for me, I went to advisors and mentors before that, before I could afford to hire the team with that expert, with those expertise. I love that because people often think of resources as, oh, I need the resources. And they think of, I need the money, but you can also look at resources of putting your time into building that network of advisors, right? That's another way of looking at resources. And it's a bit of time to build that, but then you get so much value out of that, that network of advisors, of supporters, of cheerleaders, of, yeah. As long as you're willing to, to listen, it's, I think there's a saying that a friend of mine um, taught me a long time ago. He said, it's really important to have strong opinions, but not to hold on to them. So he's like strong opinions loosely held. So if if you're presented with information that you know you should change your opinion on something, don't be afraid to let go of your old opinion and, and update it with you know the new facts and the new information that you're presented with. Which I think directly cor correlates to the conversation we were having about don't be too attached to an idea. 
you right. know, listen to what the customers are saying, listen to what people are saying, and be able to be open to pivot and evolve as you learn new information. So yeah. I, I think that's super important. So I'm curious, though, you have a couple of SKUs out there. You know, what's next for you guys? So next, I think, is... Um... I mean, next is really just a kind of a focus on on the expansion, right? So we we are mostly in um, we do a lot of direct to consumer, uh, we do um, wholesale, so we do actually some white label as well. Uh, but I think the next is is to expand to uh, other grocery stores. So we're working with uh, Green Spoon um, to help us build out our distribution network in in uh, across the America. And eventually, I think what we might do if we're looking at adding another product would be to potentially look at doing something like um, uh, something that you could add to your coffee. So, you know, that not every time you have a coffee, do you want to add any kind of functional benefit to it? But there are times when, you know, if you want to, you're focusing on, you're at work and you want to increase your mental acuity, maybe there's, you know, a coffee booster that you could add to your coffee that would have that functional benefit. So we're looking into that, or maybe it's, you want to, you know, offset the, you know, the, the, the energy you get from coffee with kind of something that will help um, make you feel a little bit calmer. So what could you add to your coffee as a coffee booster that would do that? It's something we're looking at, um, but it's not something we would do. I, I would say this coming year, it, it's kind of further down the road as, as you know, we, we, uh, I guess our focus is for now is on the coffee side of it. That's great, Greg. So for those folks listening and tuning in today, whether on the podcast or watching the video cast, where can they find your product? So the easiest way is at uh, biodynamic.coffee is the, the website. So it's B-I-O-D-Y-N-A-M-I-C.coffee. Uh, we're on Instagram too at biodynamic coffee. And uh, if you're looking for organic coffee in compostable bags, it's it's milk, M-E-L-K dot cafe, C-A-F-E. Awesome. Greg, thank you so much for joining me today. It was great to learn about you, your whole journey, and what you're building. Keep us posted. Thank you so much, Justine. So Thanks for digging in. To learn more about these stories, you can access the show notes at nextgenpurpose.com forward slash podcast. If you like what you just heard, head to Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your listening to hit subscribe and leave us a review. To join the conversation, follow us on Instagram at essential.ingredients and check out our weekly newsletter for your dose of food industry info. Visit the Next Gen Purpose YouTube channel for video casts of each episode and give this episode a like while you're there. You can also connect with me directly at justine.reichman on Instagram and the real Justine Reichman on TikTok. See you next week.